Thank you, Brian. Um, okay, so this is the part where all the authors stand and try to come up with this very convoluted explanation of how what they're going to read is actually about the theme. <laughs> um, so I'm just not going to do that. And you can decide if what I'm going to read is about the theme. Um, my, my novel, A Master Plan for Rescue, has um, four first-person point of view characters. Um, that's because I'm just more comfortable writing in first person, probably because I started as a memoirist. But two of the main point of view characters are Jack, a 12-year-old Irish boy, and Jacob, um, a young Jewish man. And um, my book came out in July, and so I've been doing a lot of readings. And mostly I've been reading from Jack, the boy's point of view. And I thought to make it special for you guys and for Peg, um, because this is one of my all-time favorite reading series, I would not do that. I would read from Jacob's point of view, the young man. And I'm going to read a section um, that takes place. Um, Jacob and um, the woman that he loves, Rebecca, are in Berlin. And the time period is just after Hitler comes to power. So bit by bit, the Jews are losing all of their rights. And um, I think that's pretty much all you need to know, except that um, Rebecca has a bad heart. Her heart um, is faulty. And um, just a shout out to Val for loaning me the glasses, because I forgot my reading glasses. Like, how smart is that when you're coming to do a reading? They look good, too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and they work really well, more importantly. Going to Paris was the only lie Rebecca ever told herself. Though I do not think it began as a lie. I think it began as a dream. A dream that had made her go to university instead of French. This, when she lived in Frankfurt and had parents and knew nothing about her heart. Now she lived in Berlin and had turned herself into an orphan and knew enough about her heart to have killed off every dream except this one. The best she could do with this one was turn it into a lie, a lie that needed to be fed from time to time. She would begin, when I go to Paris, and then she would tell me what she would do there, who she would see. Most often, the Jewish photographer, Giselle Fromd, who had escaped from Berlin three years ago with her negative strapped to her body. Always I would listen, even if she talked for an hour. Because the lie of going to Paris was the one thing Rebecca allowed herself that wasn't a brutal truth. It seemed so little to help her feed the lie. That winter, Rebecca advertised for private students, but no private students were willing to learn French from a Jew. And Rebecca had no one with whom to speak French with except herself. And that turned the lie ravenous. On a frigid night near the end of January, I came home from the shop and found Rebecca wrapped in blankets on the sofa. The heat in the building was unpredictable, and she'd forgotten to light the fire in the tiled stove, which we used for backup. It was nearly as cold inside as out, yet her face was flushed and feverish looking. When I go to Paris, she said as I stepped through the door, not, hello, not, why are you late? Because I was late. Because five minutes before closing time, an officer of the Gestapo had come into the shop with a broken gramophone. And you do not tell an officer of the Gestapo, of, of the Gestapo that it is five minutes before closing time. And would you mind very much coming back tomorrow? Not if the name on the door of your shop has a Semitic ring to it. No, you bow your head as if you are grateful for the business, and you accept the gramophone, and you stay as long as it takes to fix it, and then you arrive home late. The first place I go will be the Sorbonne, Rebecca was saying as I built the fire, and I will sit there until Giselle Frond agrees to see me. Is there food, I asked her? Have you thought about supper? I will explain that I, too, have escaped Hitler and that even though she does not know me, she does. Then I will show her my photographs. 
Stay here. I will go and see if the butcher on Fran Kalufer is still open. The butcher shop was shuttered, and I had to resort to making a watery soup from what I could find at the bottom of our vegetable box. I do not believe Rebecca noticed. She barely stopped talking long enough to put the spoon in her mouth, hardly ceased speaking long enough to swallow. She told me about the photographs Giselle Front had taken for Life magazine, pictures she had heard of in rumor, because the Nazis would never have allowed Life magazine into Germany. She has put photographs of the poorest of England's working class in the middle of a story on the British aristocracy, she told me, soup spilling down her chin. She will understand my woman with the shriveled leg leaning against Joseph Wackerly's concrete thigh. While I tried to get her to eat the sorry soup, she explained how Gisele Frond would take her to meet all of her bohemian friends. Jean-Paul Sartre, who Rebecca claimed was never cheerful, and Colette, who she believed always was. She told me this in such detail that I saw it all inside my head, the way I saw how mechanical objects worked, and I began to believe in it myself. Only when her voice became hoarse and started to crack did I remember that this was her life. I took the empty soup spoon out of her hand. It's late, I said. You can tell me the rest tomorrow. Rebecca did. She told me about Paris the next day and the day that followed, until I realized that she never went out, never left the flat, only moved from the bed to the sofa where she waited for me to come home from the shop so she could begin talking. When I go to Paris, I will live in the Latin Quarter on the Rue Saint-Jacques. And I will have an apartment where all the windows face west and south, and none of them face east. So I will never have to look toward Germany. Rebecca, have you eaten today? I will invite over all the people I have met there, all the people Giselle Frond has introduced me to, James Joyce and Jean Cocteau, Marcel Duchamp and Virginia Woolf. Let's go around to the cafe that serves the sheep stew you like. In Paris, I will eat coq au vin and cassoulet and steak frites, and I will eat them in any cafe I wish, because no one on the Boulevard Saint-Germain or the Rue de Rivolet or the Champs-Élysées will care that I am a Jew or an existentialist or a Hindu or a lesbian. Are you planning on becoming a lesbian in Paris, I smiled. I might. In Paris, I might become something different every day. A lesbian on Monday, a negress on Tuesday, a devout Catholic on Wednesday. In Paris, I shall become whatever I want. And there won't be a single Nazi to tell me that I can't become, I can't because a quota for it has already been filled. And what about me? You? She wrapped a thin arm around my neck. You, my darling, will come and fix the typewriters and cameras and bicycles of all my famous bohemian friends. Because, of course, they are artists and incapable of fixing anything for themselves. <laughs> and they will adore you and call you indispensable, which, of course, you will be. Listening to Rebecca talk was like falling into an opium dream. It was much easier to stay with her inside the live Paris and to go outside into the reality of Berlin. But I saw how the lie was feeding off her, how purple the skin beneath her eyes had turned, a color I could not blame on the early sunsets of February. And at night, after the nervous energy of feeding the lie had finally exhausted her, I would reach under the sweater she wore to bed and count her ribs with my fingers, a task that got easier each time I tried it. During the first week of March, I knocked on the door of our downstairs neighbor, Frau Noack. Frau Noack was a brown-haired, buxom woman with a tired face who disapproved of Rebecca and me. Not because we were Jewish, because we were not married. However, Frau Noack had a 12-year-old daughter who impressed me as quick-witted and also, I suspected, many things in her flat that needed fixing, as Air Noack 
had taken off two years ago with Frau Nowak's younger sister. As Frau Nowak would not let me pass her doorstep, I offered her my bargain while standing in the street. I would come once a week and fix whatever was broken in her flat if she would send her daughter upstairs to Rebecca for French lessons. Frau Noah looked suspicious, but free labor and free French lessons proved more potent than her sense of morality. Under no circumstances can the Fraulein upstairs know of our exchange, I told her. I understand, Frau Noah nodded, although I cannot imagine what she believed she understood. I must have been correct about Frau Nowak's 12-year-old daughter because Rebecca complained about her much less than she had about her gymnasium students, the bulk of whom she believed would be fortunate if they could convince anyone in France to bring them so much as a croissant. Although she did wonder where Frau Nowak had found the money to pay for French lessons. Perhaps Herr Nowak has had an attack of conscience. I very much doubt it. Then perhaps there is something to the rumor about Frau Noack taking up with an officer of the Gestapo. On the two days a week Frau Noack's daughter came for her lessons, Rebecca did not talk to me of Paris. And on those days, she generally remembered about the fire and about eating. During that time, I also scoured Berlin's pawn shops in the Kreuzberg until I found one that would sell me a shortwave radio. You can have that one cheap, the man behind the counter told me. It does not work. I should have it free then. I have to make something. I took the radio back to my shop and worked on it all afternoon. When it was fixed, I brought it home to Rebecca. She was waiting for me on the sofa, wrapped up in blankets. When I go to Paris, she began. I ignored her, placing the radio on the table where there was nothing set out for our supper, and turned it on. Static poured out, drowning Rebecca's voice. Then, because I tried it out in the shop and knew where to look for it, I turned the dial and the sound of French, no, the sound of France, filled our flat. Rebecca stopped talking. She rose from the sofa and with the blanket still wrapped about her, walked to the radio. She was staring at it like it wasn't a box filled with tubes and transmitters and amplifiers. She was looking at it as if it was something magical, something that could take the lie and not turn it back into a dream. Nothing could do that, but turn it less deadly, maybe. What are they talking about, I asked her. Soap powder. I looked at her, pale and too thin, standing before the shortwave with the blankets wrapped around her fragile shoulders. It is an advertisement and I can see it perfectly. A French woman hanging her husband's shirts on the line with the curved dome of sacre coeur at the edge of her window. The husband's shirts, they're very white. She laughed. The sound of it was so rare and lovely, I had to turn away. Two weeks later, when a chest cold kept Frau Noack's daughter from her lesson and the bad weather prevented the radio from pulling France into our flat, Rebecca greeted me once more with, when I go to Paris. But what about me, I interrupted. She looked up at me from her pile of blankets on the sofa. I cannot spend all my time fixing typewriters and cameras. What if I want to ask Jean-Paul Sartre for directions to the bibliothèque? Suppose I would like to talk to Colette about the train service to Marseille. I cannot stand around Paris like a mute. And so Rebecca began to teach me French. At first, I was not as quick as her 12-year-old student. But after a month, I was good enough for the two of us to go out occasionally and flaunt the No Jews Allowed sign in a cafe or a butcher shop. While we were often chased away, even in French, it did not bother me as much as it should have. I had only to notice how the shadows beneath Rebecca's eyes had lightened to lavender, and to think how long it had been since she had last begun a sentence with, when I go to Paris. Thank you.